what I would like to do is basically pick up where uh, Hado van Hasselt uh, left off um, and tell you a little bit more about how to do temporal credit assignment efficiently in reinforcement learning. So that's going to be sort of the overall theme um, of what we're going to talk about this afternoon, although there's a clear sort of first part and, and second part. Um, and a lot of the material that I'm going to cover is, at least in the first part, is uh, described very nicely in the second edition of the Sutton and Barto book, as well as a set of research papers, so I can also send some extra reading if anybody wants afterwards. So just to remind you, reinforcement learning is this uh, sort of formulation of machine learning uh, that formalizes perhaps a little bit the way that we uh, interact, let's say, with pets or kids or significant others or, or other entities like that who uh, may not understand uh, very detailed feedback. And so what we do when we, we try to sort of shape their behavior is we set up a system of rewards that encourages the behavior to, uh, to get in the right direction. And so uh, the idea is that you have an agent that's embedded in an environment. This agent uh, perceives some information about the environment, some observations, maybe noisy, maybe uh, delayed, and so on. Um, it can take actions. Uh, so it can change the state of the environment. And it also receives numerical rewards. And so we're going to try and train this agent to maximize the expected total reward, cumulative reward, uh, that it gets. And so the, the goal, in some sense, is to obtain a policy, a way of choosing actions that, that optimizes this long-term uh, return of the agent. And this is just sort of to summarize. These are definitions that you've encountered before. But just to, to, to summarize the notation, we're going to talk about policies, which are ways of choosing actions. So you can think of this as a mapping from state to action deterministically, or you can think of this as a mapping from state to distribution over actions in the case of stochastic policies. And we're interested in how much a policy is worth. And we call that quantity a value function. So the value function uh, that I'm going to mostly be talking about is this one that is the expectation of the discounted reward uh, or discounted return. Uh, this is a formulation that we often use uh, for two reasons. Uh, for one thing, it's mathematically convenient because it sets up uh, a theoretical framework that is all based on contractions and fixed points. So that's kind of nice. Um, on the other hand, it models certain realistic phenomena, like inflation rates, for example, um, in kind of an interesting way. So the idea is uh, that you're going to have a discount factor gamma that's less than 1. And so if you receive rewards early on, it's better than if you receive them uh, much later. And uh, what we're trying to do is measure how much expected discounted sum of rewards the agent is going to get for some particular policy. Obviously, this is going to be dependent on the way that actions are chosen. Um, and then we're going to search for the policy that, that optimizes this. And so one general approach, one general framework, is to try and take the current data, estimate the value of the current policy, and then based on that, choose a direction in which to move the policy. We're going to talk about this more today. Uh, there's different ways of doing that. Um, and then we're going to re-estimate the value of the new policy and, and kind of continue this, uh, this iteration. And the, uh, the main idea when we change the policy is that if we have an action that leads to an improved state of affairs compared to what we expected, then we're going to make it more likely. Okay, And so that, that action becomes reinforced. Okay, so the, the sort of classical way to do this, and this is something that Hado has discussed already, is dynamic programming. Okay, so the only, I guess, little bit of intuition that, that we have on the slide that perhaps you haven't discussed is what does dynamic programming do? Okay, and so what we have here is we're imagining where it's sitting at a particular state ST, okay, that's the, the white circle up top, and we're imagining all the possible choices of action that the agent has, those are the dark dots, and then all the possible next states that might happen, okay? So we can continue to do this. Essentially, you have this tree of all the possible trajectories that the agent could experience. Obviously, the choice of action is under the agent's control. That's where the policy sits. Whereas uh, these other places, so once I've, I've chosen an action, these kinds of transitions to next states, this is the environment. Okay, And so we can think of all of the algorithms in reinforcement learning conceptually as working with this tree of possibilities in the, in the finite case. And then we can think of the different trade-offs that the algorithms do as 
different ways of thinking about this tree. Okay, so now what does dynamic programming do? Dynamic programming says, let's sit at the state, consider all the possible choices of action and all the possible next states, and what we're going to do is try to ensure that the value at the state up top is basically the expectation based on this one step of look ahead, okay? And so we can write that down in the math basically by saying we're going to take the expectation of the actions of the agent, that's pi of A given ST, and then the expectation over the moves of the environment, right, which are controlled by, by P, by the probability of the environment, and we're going to take the, the quantity of interest, in this case the quantity of interest is the immediate reward, plus the value of the next state, discounted. Okay, and so, uh, so essentially what we're doing is kind of a breadth first search, okay, in some sense. Um, now obviously uh, th this is pretty clear and clean, okay, uh, and it's very comprehensive, but also could get us into trouble computationally because if the state space is very large, right, uh, then the branching factor here is going to be really big. And typically, the state space is exponential in some other quantity, right? Because states consist of features, and so, uh, you know, the state space has combinations of these features and, and tends to be very big. So there's a curse of dimensionality that manifests itself in dynamic programming, and Bellman actually recognized this from the very beginning of these algorithms, okay? And it comes in three different flavors, and sort of to understand that, I've rewritten here one equation that I think you covered with Hado, which is this sort of value iteration equation. Value iteration is a dynamic programming algorithm for estimating the optimal value function that can be achieved in a Markov decision process. It basically says, let's look at the immediate reward and the expected value of the next states, okay? And we're going to try and maximize this. And so we're gonna run an iterative algorithm where we start with some guess about the value function, maybe it's all zeros, and then we're going to apply this algorithm at all states iteratively until there's no more change, right? The change gets under some epsilon. So it's a very nice algorithm. If the state space is fairly small, the action space is fairly small, we can run this, runs fast, and so on. But if you inspect it, okay, there's sort of three problematic things with this algorithm. And that's sort of the crux of what reinforcement learning tries to fix, okay? One problem is that we have these loops over all states, okay? And again, the state space in a, in a game like Go, for example, is unmanageable. You can't really loop over the entire state space. So, of course, what, what do we do when we have this kind of problem? Well, we're going to try to sample because we're machine learning people and that's what machine learning people do when you have an unmanageable uh, quantity of things. So we're going to uh, sort of estimate these kinds of loops by taking some samples, okay? Now, the action set might actually also be very large or continuous. I'll tell you a little bit later in sort of the second part of the presentation what we're gonna do about that. And then there's actually another sort of interesting thing that doesn't quite fall out of the equation, but it's very important, which is that the solution may require chaining many steps, okay? So what do we mean by this? If you imagine something like the game of Go, typically the reward function is set up such that you only get a reward at the end of a game where you've won or you've lost. So there's some states where a game has been won and those are rewarded with a plus one. There's some states where a game has been lost they're rewarded with minus one. All the other states have immediate reward of zero. So when we're doing these kinds of iterations, a lot of the iterations are actually going to be very unproductive because immediate reward is zero the initial value function maybe is zero. We're observing nothing for a long time. And then slowly, slowly values would propagate from the good states and from the back state, bad states backwards. But that takes a long time. Okay? And so, uh, you know, this, this boils down to the fact that an agent needs to play a whole game and needs to understand how the values change during the entire game in order to, uh, to understand how to choose actions. So uh, sort of propagating credit propagating these rewards over many time steps is something that we need our agents to do. And so that's, that's sort of one of the aspects of reinforcement learning that's interesting to think about. Now, one algorithm that, that tries to, uh, to do this in a different way is Monte Carlo. And again, this is something you discussed with Hado. And really here, we're just looking at this picture to try to understand what Monte Carlo does, okay? Uh, 
So Monte Carlo sampling basically says, instead of thinking of all possible actions and all possible states, we're just going to take samples. And in this particular case, we're gonna take whole samples of trajectories. So we think of paths through this tree, individual paths. In the case of Go, we might play games all the way to the end of the game. There we know whether the game was won or lost. We can take that reward and attribute it to the whole trajectory. Okay? And in some sense, that's very good information because it's sort of correct, right? It's what happened at the end of the game. And of course, we can now take multiple paths and average their outcomes. And if we have a lot of compute, then we actually scale the computation very well, and that's how we, we obtain good results. Okay? The problem is that uh, it takes a while to generate this kind of data, and also there's going to be some amount of variance. Okay? And so even though these are unbiased samples, uh, right, in, mach in machine learning terms, unbiased is not necessarily good because it probably has high variance. There is a different way of thinking about it, which is temporal difference learning. And so we're going to focus on temporal difference style algorithms uh, mostly today. And the idea in temporal difference learning is that we're actually not going to play a whole trajectory all the way to the end, OK? but we're actually going to take just one step of that trajectory and then use the estimated value at the end of that one step as a proxy for what would happen from then on. So you can think of this like an intersection in some sense of what dynamic programming does and what Monte Carlo does. In dynamic programming, you think of all possible actions, all possible states, but you cut off the search after one step, okay? In Monte Carlo, you have one trajectory all the way to the end. All right, we're going to take the intersection of that. That's one step. Okay? And that's what, what TD does. And so just get some reward, value of the next state. And we're going to compute an error signal based on this. So we're going to make a target for the algorithm, which is reward plus gamma value of ST plus 1. And we're going to train the estimate of V of ST towards this target. So that's kind of interesting from two points of view. On one hand, we can make these estimates all the time as the algorithm goes along. We don't have to wait until the end of a trajectory uh, in order to do that. On the other hand, if you're familiar with supervised learning, this may seem very strange because we're making targets based on the agent's guess, right? V is an estimate. And so we're pretending it's correct somehow and using it to make a target. So that poses a whole bunch of interesting questions from the point of view of people who are used to supervised learning because assumptions from supervised learning are actually violated, right? For one thing, the noise in the target depends on the estimates of the agent's uh, current uh, value function. And so a an theoretical analysis becomes both more challenging and more interesting. Okay. So, just to summarize, temporal difference learning methods do two things. They bootstrap, okay, based on initial estimates, uh, like dynamic programming, but they also sample, right? So they don't compute an expected value, they just take a sample and, and use that, like Monte Carlo methods. Okay. <coughs> so let's assume for a minute that we are given a policy Okay, pi, and all we want to do is compute its value function, right? So we want to compute v pi. Um, so a Monte Carlo method would do the following, would play a trajectory, okay? Based on that trajectory from a state of t, we would have an actual observed return gt, okay? That's the sum of discounted rewards. And then we would use that as a target, okay? And we, we subtract the value of the state, Right, and we're going to make an update with a step size parameter alpha that's in the direction of this error. And in this case, we're very close to supervised learning because GT actually is a sample that was obtained from the environment. Pi is fixed, so there is a well-defined distribution of, of inputs that comes in. The only thing that's not like supervised learning in this case is actually that uh, we have a dependence in the inputs. Right? So the states come on a trajectory, so they're actually not drawn IID, but that's a, that's a simple thing. That's a small thing. The simplest temporal difference method, which is called TD0, is going to look very similar, but instead of using the actual return GT, it's going to use immediate reward RT plus 1, 
plus gamma, our current estimate, V of ST plus 1. Okay? And so we make up this target that contains an estimate uh, of the value function that's based on the agent's current guess. And then we're still going to use this as if it were truth, and we're going to make an update with a step size parameter alpha. Okay, so what does this do? Just to sort of uh, show a very simple example, this is a random walk, very small random walk in which we can compute things exactly so we can, uh, so the agent is equally likely to go left and right. We have here the straight line in the middle, these are the true values which we can compute exactly in this case by solving a linear system of equations. Um, and then we're looking at uh, estimates of temporal difference learning uh, after different amounts of data. Okay, so th these sort of crooked lines are the approximations that we obtain, and you can see that as the amount of data grows, we're getting a better and better approximation. In the limit, you'd converge to the right values. Okay, now what is the advantage, if any, of doing this compared to doing Monte Carlo? Okay, these are sort of learning curves. Here, this is something that's very typical in machine learning. We plot uh, on the x-axis the amount of data that we had, and on the y-axis the, the error estimates, right? And all the algorithms, of course, reduce error over time as the amount of data grows. But you can see here that the temporal difference methods uh, reduce the error faster than Monte Carlo. And that's basically a bias variance trade-off. We're going to talk about this in a minute. Temporal difference learning does a different trade-off where it reduces variance at the cost of some introduced bias. And so in order to understand that, I'm going to ask you to do a little exercise. Okay, suppose you're a reinforcement learning agent. Okay, you're in an environment, you don't know what it is. Okay, but you get some data. Here are some trajectories that you see. So you have here, one trajectory that has A with a zero followed by B with a zero, and the episode terminates. You have some episodes that are B followed by a one, and one episode with a B followed by a zero. Okay, and let's assume that, that the environment is Markovian. It's a Markov decision process. Now, what would you say is a good estimate for the value of B? Anybody have a guess? Yes? Six over, Six over eight. Very good. What's a good estimate for the value of A? Yes? Zero is the only one trajectory it has a zero on it. Is that the only possibility? Yes? It's clearly not the only possibility, it's the only one we've seen. It's the only trajectory that we've actually seen that involves A. We also know it's a Markovian environment. So what does that mean? So Monte Carlo would do exactly what, what was suggested, which is to say A has a value of zero, it's only one trajectory we've seen, that's the target. Okay. In dynamic programming, what you would do is take this data and fit a model with it, okay? And the model would ask, where do I go from A and where do I go from B, okay? And B clearly goes to some terminal state, right? Maybe it goes to two different terminal states, one that has a reward of one and one that has a reward of zero. And based on, based on our guesses, we sort of estimate that we have a six on eight chance from B to get to the reward of one, right? Now, what does A do? Well, in our trajectories, the only thing that we've seen A do is actually get an immediate reward of zero and transition to B. Okay, as far as we know, A transitions to B with probability one. Okay, and the estimated value of B is six on eight. So the estimated value on A, if it goes to B, should be zero plus gamma V hat of B. Okay. 
which is not zero, and it's not exactly what we see in the data. It is kind of, right? But it depends. We're making here an assumption that the environment is Markovian, and that assumption bakes in some prior belief about what the value of A should be, essentially. Okay? It's not a Bayesian prior, right? But it's, a, it's an initialization that's based on the value of B. So that's the kind of estimate that you get based on temporal difference learning, right? The idea is that you take the data, you fit the, the model of the environment based on counts or, or any kind of empirical thing like this, and if you were to run temporal difference learning on your, on your data over and over again, you'd get this kind of result where you've built the Markov decision process and now you use it to make your guesses. Okay. So what happens here, okay, is that if we do Monte Carlo, what we obtain is a prediction that minimizes the mean squared error on the training set, okay? the trajectories that we've observed, and that would be zero. If we consider the fact that the problem is actually sequential and it's a Markov decision process, we actually would set the value of A to gamma V hat B. If gamma is one in this case, then we're just going to take the value of A to be the same as the value of B, despite the fact that we've never seen a good, good outcome from A in the data set, okay? So, the way you think about it is you do a maximum likelihood estimate of the model of the process and then you use that approximate model to compute the value function. And that gives you a different path and it gives you a different estimate and it is biased by the fact that you're making the Markovian assumption. Okay, but at the same time it reduces variance. Now why, do, why does it reduce variance intuitively? Well in this case you've only seen one single trajectory that comes with A in it. Okay? Whereas there are many more other trajectories that have B in it, and you're kind of leveraging all of that data in order to estimate the value of A. Um, so sometimes people call this the certainty equivalence estimate, okay? and it's clearly different. In the limit, as you get an infinite amount of data, and if the environment truly is Markovian, you will converge to the same answer. But in the short run, it is not the same answer. Okay, now what happens when we have function approximation and we're trying to use these kinds of methods? Well, what we're going to do is instead of thinking of the value function as having one entry for every state, we're going to think of the value function as being parameterized by some parameter vector theta. Okay, so v hat now might be a linear function approximator or maybe it's a neural net with millions of parameters, doesn't matter what it is, theta is just a vector. Uh, and so now we can use this, uh, this function approximator in order to provide targets. Um, so how are we going to obtain an algorithm out of this? If this were stochastic gradient descent, what we would do is we would take an error measure, something like the mean squared error, right? In this case, we don't have the mean squared error, we have a sampled squared error that we compute at time step t. We take the gradient of that error signal with respect to the parameter vector theta, and then we'd make an update to the parameter vector uh, in the direction that minimizes the error with some step size, okay? So for value function approximation, we have some target at time step t. We have the squared error, typically, and so we would take a gradient estimate of this, okay? And that would have to take the gradient of this error signal. Now, in the case of Monte Carlo, this is perfectly fine. The target is fixed, okay? It does not depend on, on our estimates, and so we can just take the gradient with respect to v hat. We're going to do something that's a little bit strange, okay? We're basically going to do the same kind of thing in the case of TD, even though we know that the target actually has the parameter vector in it. But if you try to do this exactly correctly with a gradient-based algorithm, and in the most vanilla fashion, you get garbage. And so you can't do it, okay? And so instead we're going to pretend for a minute that the target's fixed, okay? And so the second term, we're not gonna have a derivative from the target, we're only gonna have a derivative from v hat of st, and we can compute that if our uh, 
uh, approximator is differentiable, and that's how we get what Sutton and Bartha book calls a semi-gradient method, okay? It's not a technical term, it really just means we're only going to take that gradient on one of the terms, not both of them, okay? And in the linear case, that gives you a very nice estimate over here, where the gradient is just going to be the feature vector of the state, and you can do the same sort of thing with action value functions, and, and uh, everything works out basically the same way. In the case of action value functions, the features are on states and actions rather than just states. Okay. Um, so what is this going to give us? Well, if we really did stochastic gradient descent, we would converge to the minimum of the error objective, okay? But, and that's what Monte Carlo would do. Um, and you can uh, do the analysis, it's not a very complicated analysis, so in the case of linear function approximation, we have one globally optimal solution, and, and doing this uh, procedure will, will converge to that. Okay? Um, now, it's useful to look at an example in order to understand what TD would do with, with linear function approximation, and that example is what people call state aggregation. Now, these kinds of methods used to be very popular. In practice, people don't use them anymore because now it's just so easy to throw in a deep net. But from the point of view of theoretical understanding, uh, state aggregation is still quite useful and linear function approximation is still quite useful because we don't really understand nonlinear function approximation, even in the supervised learning case. And so doing anything theoretically in the reinforcement learning case has proven to be very difficult. And we only have negative results. So we're going to focus on a case where we can get some positive results. Uh, so in, in uh, the tabular uh, sort of state aggregation case, you can have a state space, maybe it's continuous, maybe it's discrete by very but very large. What we're going to do is essentially partition it into buckets, disjoint buckets, okay? And so our feature vectors are going to be uh, essentially uh, indicators of which bucket does the state uh, appear in. And so now we can uh, take uh, TD or Monte Carlo or any of these algorithms and run it with this kind of uh, representation. And essentially the gradient here is going to be these indicator functions um, and has a, a very simple form. And um, <coughs> this is now a, a, a random walk example where we have in fact a thousand states, but we've bucketed them okay, into uh, 10 groups of 100 states each. And so we're looking at Monte Carlo. What does Monte Carlo do? Okay, it's a random walk. We're just doing estimation. The true value is this red line over here. We know exactly what it is, right, because uh, it's just a uniform random walk. Um, and then we're looking at what's the Monte Carlo value that's computed, okay? And this is the zigzag blue line here, okay? Now, why is it zigzag? Well, because we forced states to belong to some partition. And so all the states within that partition have to share the same value, okay? So each partition has one of these flat values, and then you move to the next partition, and that's the only place where you allow a jump. Okay, so, so you get a discontinuous approximation. Of course, if we made the partitions uh, finer, we would get a better approximation. But you can see that you're always going to have some errors that are unavoidable. They come from the way that we've defined the features, okay? People sometimes call this the inductive bias of the function approximator. And of course, the more capacity your approximator has, the more uh, fine-grained it gets, the better you can, you can do this kind of thing. So the function approximator itself introduces some systematic error, some bias, okay? And it does also reduce the variance. Why? Well, now if we have several states that fall in the same bin, all of the data from each of those states is used to compute the estimate. So the approximator itself further puts in bias in order to reduce the variance. Now, let's try to do this semi-gradient TD, okay, in this case. And this is just to show the algorithm. The algorithm is very simple, okay? It just says we're going to run each episode. So that means choose an action from the policy. We take the action, we take the reward and the next state. We're going to use our estimator 
to compute v hat of s prime, the estimated value of the next state, the estimated value of the current state. This gives us the error signal, which is the temporal difference error signal. And we're going to put in here the gradient of v hat, okay? which, in, which only depends on v hat and nothing else. And uh, we just, we're just going to uh, accumulate these updates over time. And so now, the question is, what does this converge to? So I'll show you the answer empirically first, and then we're going to look at sort of why that answer appears. Okay? So like in the case of Monte Carlo, we get this kind of staircase approximation, because we have the same type of approximator, right? So each of these groups of states has to share the same value. Uh, but you can see that the approximator is actually kind of off, okay, from the line compared to the Monte Carlo approximator, right? So this is the further bias that's induced by temporal difference learning, right? The estimates are not quite aligned with the line, okay? And now why is this? Well, states actually go to the next partition, okay? So when we're doing these updates, what we're trying to do is kind of maintain consistency with the neighboring partitions. And that introduces a further bias, right? Things can't move arbitrarily to fit the long-term supervised data because we're trying to maintain this consistency with neighboring partitions. So now let's try to think a little bit about what kind of answer does uh, temporal difference learning actually give you, okay? And in order to do that, actually, I'm going to need a picture, which hopefully you guys will be able to see. And then we're going to look at the math. So let's assume Let's assume that really, really we have some MDP, we have the policy pi, and uh, you know, the value function lives in some space, possibly a high dimensional space. This is the true value function. Okay. But now actually I want to represent this with a linear function approximator. So what does this mean? This means that really all the representable functions are in some plane here. Okay? So my estimates depend on the parameter vector theta, okay? And if they're all linear, okay, then the estimates have to live in this hyperplane somewhere, okay? And each of the values of the parameter th vector theta gives me an estimate of the value function, okay? Now, what is the best possible estimate that I could get if this were geometry. What should I do? I should do a projection of v pi to the plane, right? And that's the best possible thing that I could do, okay? So this is actually the TD fixed point, okay? If I were to run the algorithm exactly, all right, this is what I would like to, to get. Now, obviously there's some error here, okay? This error here is the bias due to the function approximator. I can't wash that out. Once I've chosen the parameterization of the function approximator, that will never go away. Okay. Um, now, what do I do when I do iterations, actually, of the algorithm? Okay. What we do is we take some guess, some parameter vector, and we apply to it an operator, okay, which is an approximation of the Bellman operator. The Bellman operator applies the reward and the value of the next state. So we basically take a parameter, we take it out here, okay, 
by applying the reward and the transition probability that's estimated, and then we project it back down. Okay, then we're going to take it up again and project it back down. And essentially what we would like is to have these iterations converging, if everything goes well, to the projection, because that's the best possible thing. Okay? So the analysis of these algorithms is a little bit different from what you normally do <coughs> in supervised learning, where you think of the squared loss and so on. You have to think of these iterations and the fact that we apply a Bellman operator and a projection, a Bellman operator and a projection, and you need to think what's happening during these iterations, right? And ideally, what you would see is that the distance to this uh, sort of uh, projection of the value function should be shrinking, right? And if we can set up a contraction on that, that would be great, okay? That doesn't mean that we're doing gradient steps at all. Okay, we need to set up a contraction, but that's not necessarily a gradient of some global error function. And in fact, there's a nice paper from 89 that shows that these kinds of algorithms are not the gradient of anything. Okay, but they are, they, you can set them up to be contractions and then they'll still converge. So it's a, it's a very different kind of analysis that we do. So that's sort of outlined over here what this analysis looks like. Okay, we have a TD0 update, okay, on top. It's just sort of writing out in the linear case what we would be computing. And if we look at the expectation of the next parameter vector given the previous parameter vector, we see two matrices that appear, okay? Uh, well, a matrix and a vector, okay? So B is the easiest part of this. B is really the expected reward for the features, okay? So in the case where we're doing, for example, state aggregation, this would just be the average immediate reward that you get over the states in a partition. Okay. A is a bit of a more interesting quantity. It's phi t times phi t minus gamma phi t plus one transpose. Okay. Um, if you were do in the real MDP, you would end up here with uh, I minus gamma P, right? I minus gamma that times the, the transition matrix of, of the environment. But now that you have features, you end up with something that depends on the feature vector. And so, in fact, we need to be a little bit careful in order to make sure that this matrix is going to be well behaved, okay? Because this is the key matrix that's going to play out in iterations. And there are some approximators, like state aggregation, like averagers that make this matrix well behaved, but in general, we don't necessarily know what will happen, okay? If we can manage to make this matrix well behaved and we can take an inverse, okay, then we end up with a fixed point of these iterations, that's theta td. Not, the whole proof is not written out here, right? Because we're not really talking, we're talking everything in expectation, right? There's some variance elements that need to be sorted out, but in general, we can guarantee with all this sort of broad class of algorithms that what you converge to is going to be within a constant factor of the projection point, okay? So that's kind of nice. It's an interesting type of guarantee. Um, I have a question. Yes. So in this analysis, the, the function approximator has to be linear because otherwise we, the iterations don't go through this kind of matrix construction and matrix inversion. If the function approximator is not linear, uh, then we basically don't know <laughs> theoretically what happens. Uh, the style of analysis that people have tried is basically to say, uh, you know, if you have a nonlinear approximator, you can still have a locally linear uh, sort of tangent space, and you can try to work with that tangent space. And then, if your nonlinear approximator is very, very well behaved, right, which means very smooth and so on, then when you're moving around the tangent space, it moves around very slowly. And so then maybe we can still say something. But those are very contrived kinds of approximators that nobody actually uses in practice. And so as a result, the theoretic 
statistical analysis is not really that compelling. So there is actually a huge gap in nonlinear function approximation between, on one hand, wonderful results in Atari and motor control tasks. I'll show you some videos later and things like this. And on the other hand, we understand almost nothing. And theoretical results are uh, the ones that we have are counterexamples, so basically negative results. Okay. Other questions? Okay, so basically what we have, uh, <clears throat> what we're sort of constructing, is a more unified view of reinforcement learning algorithms that has multiple types of algorithms in it, okay? So, and they, they kind of differ in terms of what I'm going to call the width of the backup and the height of the backup. So if you think of this tree of possibilities, right, the width of the backup says, do I look at all possible next actions and all possible next states or just some of them, okay? So if I look at all of them, right, and I look at one step, it's dynamic programming. If I look at all the possibilities and I look as deep as I want, that's basically exhaustive search, right? And you can do exhaustive search in fancier ways. There's now a resurgence, for example, of evolutionary algorithms for doing this kind of search in, in uh, various interesting ways. If, on the other hand, what we're doing is looking just as samples, one state samples from the expectation, then we have this gradation of algorithms. On one end, we have temporal difference learning. On the other hand, we have Monte Carlo methods. Okay. Now, you can see that there's a space in between there. It would be interesting to actually fill in that space. Okay. So what we're going to talk about now is how to fill in that space. And the goal is basically to have some nice interpolation between Monte Carlo, which in some sense, you know, is pleasing and conforms to our intuitions of minimizing mean squared error, right? But maybe has high variance. And on the other hand, TD, which has a lot of bias, right? Maybe we can get something that's kind of in between and the best of both worlds. So we're going to try to do that now. Okay. And so the idea is quite simple. Is why, why limit ourselves to one step? Right? TD makes this decision that we're going to wait one step and then make a guess about the value function. But you could just wait n steps. And n could be anything you want. Okay? You could do it for two steps or three steps and so on. If you wait on all the way until the end of the episode. So if you go to infinity, right, you get exactly Monte Carlo. And so <laughs> that's the idea of n step TD predictions is to take these snippets of trajectories we start from the top, we take the rewards along the way, and at the state where we stop, we're just going to use our value function to compute an estimate. Yes? Do you, do you always start at the same point? Hmm? Do you always start at the same point when you get it to a certain state? We are assuming that we always start in the same state distribution. So it's not necessarily the same, same state, but there is an initial state distribution. And so oftentimes, in fact, when we do function approximation, when we compare different algorithms, with re we compare them with respect to the values of the states in this, in this distribution, which may be non-exhaustive. Are there any other questions? Okay. Okay, so now we can make n-step targets. Okay. Um, so the one-step target is just the immediate reward and the value of the next state. A two-step target would be the first reward plus gamma, the second reward you get, right? Plus gamma squared, the value of the state after two time steps, right? And so you can clearly see that you can, you know, pick your n and, and do this kind of thing. One interesting aspect here, okay? is if you notice here the gamma, right? Remember, gamma is typically something less than 1, OK? And so you can see that in a two-step update, we're in some sense relying less on the guess that we're making from our function approximator, because we take this guess and we discount it by a gamma squared. OK, so it gets washed out. And if I were to look something like 100 steps in the future, right, with a gamma to the n, the estimate from our approximator actually would get quite washed out. Okay? Of course, if we go all the way to infinity, right, we get Monte Carlo where whatever our approximator says matters none at all. Okay? But now you have this interesting knob 
that tells you how much do you want to rely on your current guesses and how much do you just want to take the data that comes from trajectories, just the trajectories, and build your estimates on that. And so essentially you can think of the sense step as a, as a knob that goes from more TD style methods that are more biased to Monte Carlo methods which have higher variance and as you might imagine, it's going to make a trade-off, and somewhere in between, typically, there's a good point. Yes? Uh, so the, the, this discount makes the uh, returns just propagate a little further into the network? Yes. But not everywhere? Not everywhere, necessarily. That's right. So if the network is too deep, we can still get the problem of not seeing anything in our single step? Yes. Okay. That's correct. And so we're going to need to still work on that problem. So this is a, a little bit of the answer. It's not quite the full answer. Okay, any other questions? Okay. Okay, so, so this is sort of the, what people sometimes call the forward view. Okay? So you have uh, your agent. Okay, it's sitting there at state ST. And there's a trajectory that's going on. And the agent is looking on that trajectory and taking some chunk of it and steps of it and making a backup for itself at time step ST. And then it sort of jumps to the next state. So you can have, always have to remember some things in advance, right? You have to remember always n steps, what's happened, n steps from now, in order to make a backup. And the backups are a little bit delayed. Okay, so if I, if I have a 10-step TD algorithm, it has to wait for 10 steps in order to have a target to update towards. Okay, so that's, sometimes it's a little bit problematic, but usually it's not a big deal. Okay, so, so like I said, the estimate is basically available at time step t plus n, and that's when we're going to make an update. Uh, notice that all these algorithms always look very similar, right? We always have a target, and we have the current estimate, and this target in this case is this kind of n step return. Okay? Um, that's not a real return, is it? Mm -hmm. This is not a real return, and not an estimate. This is a real return plus the estimate it comes at the nth time step here. So it still, it still has an estimate there. But because of the gamma in front, that estimate plays less of a role. So we're relying more on the data and less on our guess. Okay. Okay, so this is just to sort of illustrate what does this give us. And uh, so what does this plot have? We're looking at different values of n. We're looking at multiple values of the step size alpha, right? Because, of course, alpha also plays a role in trading off bias and variance and trading off the speed of learning. So alpha is our step size here. Uh, obviously, for different algorithms, we're going to have different optimal alpha. So here, you know, these are small examples, so we can run things exhaustively. And we're plotting the root mean squared error in the estimation compared to true values averaged over the states, okay? But averaged over 10 episodes only. And the reason for this is that we really want to see the bias variance trade-off, and that happens when we don't have that much data, okay? And so what you see is, is something very characteristic, right? Which is these U-shaped curves. In supervised learning, you see the same sort of thing when you have bias variance trade-off. There's, you know, typically some parameter that you're varying, like in this case, the step size, and the best trade-off is somewhere in the middle. But there's a further interesting aspect to this, okay, which is that the n, right, the number of steps, also creates a trade-off, okay? So this red curve here, n equal to 1, this is TD0. The curve all the way on the top there is essentially Monte Carlo. And so what you see is actually that that's pretty terrible after just 10 episodes. And that's because of the variance. Okay. This one has high bias, but it's got lower variance, and so it's doing better in this case. But the best ones are somewhere intermediate. Okay, in this case, the best one really, if I took the best learning rate, is perhaps the sun equal to 4. Of course, this is problem dependent, okay? Um, but now you have this extra knob that allows you to trade, to trade off bias and variance. There's been quite some interesting research trying to establish if there's an optimal schedule for this N 
if somehow you can start uh, with, uh, you know, it's small and by make it big or the other way around, it's really not clear uh, how to do this in, in some kind of principled way. And so right now people still do it uh, basically in the machine learning way by trying it out and uh, getting lots of experiments and then looking, staring at these curves and picking out uh, what's the best one. There's been some work also in trying to do this optimization automatically, um, of course, over time, uh, but not in sort of based on analytics, just based on using populations of agents and, and using averaging over that. Um, and the same kind of effect you observe when you have function approximation. So this was our tabular example over here. This is the big random walk with a thousand states. And you see the same sort of thing, the U-shaped curves with a step size and then temporal difference learning TD0 being here, Monte Carlo still being terrible, okay, and these kinds of uh, intermediate <laughs> values of n uh, doing the best. Okay, any questions? Mm -hmm. um, what happens if you use a decaying constant? I mean, decaying learning size. So, from a theoretical point of view, in fact, you should always use a decaying step size because with a fixed step size, what happens is you will get to the neighborhood of the solution and then you'll jump around. And the size of the ball in which you jump depends on the step right. size. So, if you want to actually stabilize, you need to decay it over time. And the, the same Robbins Monroe conditions that apply to supervised learning have to be done here. So any schedule for the learning rate uh, that essentially brings it, you know, so that the sum of the squares is finite and uh, the sum of the learning rates over time is infinite will do. Uh, but empirically, of course, some schedules are better than others. And so especially like decaying things too fast can be a problem. Now, again, um, this is a question that, you know, in practice, uh, people try to avoid because it's just harder to optimize a schedule than it is to optimize for a fixed value. Um, and we don't have, right now, that many good options. There's been some really interesting recent work on meta-learning uh, that tries to address this problem in a more systematic way. So meta-learning in general means you're trying to learn the hyperparameters in such a way as to do well on a collection of tasks. And there was uh, an interesting paper by Chelsea Finn and Peter Rabiel last year that essentially formulated that problem uh, and then proposed some solutions, including for some of these reinforcement learning algorithms in order to tweak things uh, like the learning rate. And so I think there's a lot of excitement right now. We still don't know if that's the, the, really the best solution, but it's, uh, it's uh, promising. Okay, so um, what happens to the, uh, the end-step methods? Do they converge? What do they converge to? Okay, um, again, one way to think about this is by thinking about this sort of uh, error reduction property. So if we have an end-step return and we, we compute the maximum error, right, of that end-step return with respect to the true value function, Okay, uh, what does that do? Well, you can see that you're going to end up with a gamma to the n, okay, uh, constant in front of, of the max error in the one step. So this is all tabular, okay. Uh, in function approximation land, things are a little bit messier, but you can see something quite similar, okay. So what this is intuitively telling you is that when you're doing n step, you also have a contraction property. If you did it for one step algorithm, the contraction constant would be gamma. If you're doing it in the tabular case for n step algorithms, the contraction is going with gamma to the n. Okay? So typically it goes faster, right? The worst error goes down faster. Um, another thing that I would like to point out is that very often we do these analyses in, uh, using uh, infinity norm, okay, uh, as opposed to L2 norm because it's just a pain to work with the L2 norm in the case of reinforcement learning. Uh, 
Uh, but typically all of the analyses with significantly more pain can be made to work with other kinds of norms as well. It's just a matter of the math becomes more involved and it's not always clear that it provides us any further information because the results end up being quite similar. Um, so I want to show you one sort of cute tidbit that's going to become uh, useful a little bit later on that's related to this kind of contraction property, okay? Which is um, sort of a different way to think about the model. Um, okay, so, so here's, a, here's the Bellman equation for policy evaluation. Now I'm writing it in vector matrix form, okay? So V pi is the estimate of the value function, R pi is the actual reward, okay? And gamma P pi, P pi is the true matrix, transition matrix of the MDP when I put policy pi in it uh, with a gamma in front. So you can think of this like gamma P pi as one matrix F, okay? And so sometimes we uh, call this the Bellman operator for policy evaluation. And why do we call it the Bellman operator? Because you can imagine any value function and you can imagine applying this operator to it over and over again. Okay. Um, and as we discussed, this operator is a contraction, right, with a, with a, a gamma constant. So now, of course, we can expand this, right? We can expand it and make it two-step, right? So we do the algebra here. Uh, nothing really interesting happens. We see here appearing another reward vector, and we see here another matrix. Okay, so the reward vector is R pi plus gamma P pi R pi, okay? And then the transition is just gamma squared P pi squared. So you can see that this is gonna be also an operator. Uh, it has a gamma squared contraction, okay? Um, and we can do this for any number of steps, right? So for any number of steps, I really can think of this as having a reward vector Bn, and the matrix Fn, that's really like the power of the initial matrix, okay? Now, people who um, do this kind of thing, for example, in computer graphics or in animation or something like this, don't like to think about this as two different entities, right? There's the vector and then there's the matrix and then you have to do something different to the vector and the matrix. What you do is you work with homogeneous coordinates, okay? And so, uh, you can think of, you know, so in, in graphics, for example, you have translations and you have rotations, right? And you put them in the same matrix and it's a transform, right? That takes your current points and translates and rotates them and computes the result, okay? And so we can actually do this here, okay? You think of the immediate reward vector as a translation of the value function and the transition matrix as a rotation right, of some sort, and so you can put them in one, okay, one matrix that we add a one there and we add a zero, now we're in homogeneous coordinates, we can apply that to the value function, okay, and so now we don't have to worry about rewards and transitions anymore, you have one operator, okay, and it always works with any kind of vector and gives you, spits out another vector, okay, and so now you know, doing something like an n-step model just becomes powers of this matrix, okay? And we're done. And so n-step just means we take this matrix, raise it to the power, and, and that's it. So that's, that's quite nice and elegant, and we're going to leverage this kind of representation um, a little bit later as well. Okay, are there any questions or comments? Yeah. Um, so if n is big enough, Yes. So we're not, it's, it's sort of a conceptual tool. Okay. We're never actually representing the matrix explicitly. And all of the algorithms, uh, you know, they essentially work with, first of all, approximations of this, because the matrix requires knowing the whole model. Yeah. Uh, and second of all, um, we, uh, we sort of, uh, you know, might have nonlinear approximators or whatever, where there's no matrix at all, right? But conceptually, if the state space is finite, right, we can think about working with this matrix and then that, you know, the math, the proofs and so on become very clear. And when we're doing approximations, we can think of 
you know, building an approximate matrix and then working with that, and how much error do we accumulate working with that approximation to, to the matrices compared to uh, using the real one, okay? And you can kind of see that, uh, you know, errors would be uh, rather problematic, right? Because these matrices are going to end up, you know, so we do these iterations, but, the, you know, when you spell out what the iteration does, you're going to have some inverses in there. And so uh, having errors in these matrices can be quite damaging, right? Okay. So now we can do basically all the kinds of things that I said so far to action value functions. And with Hado, you discussed one specific algorithm that leverages action value functions, which is Q-learning, okay? Uh, but there's actually several such algorithms. Um, and the idea really is the same as, as with state value functions, except we fit functions that depend on both states and actions, okay? And we sort of, sort of parameterize them over states and actions, okay? So this is just an example of writing out the TD rule for action values. It's the same as usual TD, but instead of putting here V of S, I put Q of S A everywhere, and the algorithm otherwise is all the same. Okay. Now, there's two ways of doing control, okay? Uh, one which is called on policy and one which is called off policy. And let me try to sort of explain the difference because it's actually kind of interesting to think about these two ways. Um, on policy control basically means we have some policy, we're using it to gather data, then we're going to change it and continue gathering data and estimating the value of this current policy that we're actually using for behaving. Okay? So that's called SARSA. Okay? And the idea is that we're going to start with some um, initial policy. We're going to run episodes. During an episode, we're going to choose the action uh, that's derived from this policy. Okay? And the policy depends on the value functions that we have and typically tries to be a little bit greedy with respect to the current value functions. There's different ways to do this. We're going to talk about that as well. So we run this policy, and over here, really, we have policy evaluation, right? We pretend this policy is fixed. We're going to make targets based on it. We're going to use TD updates here and uh, move the Q values, except, of course, once we move the Q values, the policy is, in fact, going to change, okay? So one way to uh, sort of visualize what's going on is that we have um, a kind of approximate policy iteration algorithm, if you will. Okay, so in policy iteration, you start with some policy pi zero, and then you compute v pi 0 and q pi 0 and then you compute a new policy pi 1 and so on and usually um, v pi i is computed just by using the Bellman policy evaluation operator okay and v pi i plus 1 is obtained by doing something greedy to q pi i. So gamma is typically thought of as a greedification operator, could be taking the max action at one step, could be taking the max action at all steps, could be taking uh, something like epsilon greedy, where the max action has more probability than all the other actions, right? Or it could be something like a Boltzmann distribution where we choose the actions sort of in proportion to the magnitude of their value functions. And all of these things are guaranteed to provide an improvement. Now, what do we do in this case? Well, we do the same sort of thing, except we do it approximately, okay? So here we never actually compute T exactly, but we have some approximation to it. Maybe that approximation is really local and it's really just based on one transition. And then here, when we do the gridification, we're always going to be soft, 
okay? Soft means every action has to continue being taken with at least some minimal probability because we have approximations everywhere and we don't want to rule things out. So one soft algorithm is epsilon greedy with some fixed finite epsilon. We can decay that towards zero if we want over time, but we have to do it very gradually because we need to get data about all of the possible actions at all of the possible states enough. Okay. So, you know, what happens to these kinds of algorithms, right? They're, they're, it's sort of weird, right? Because we move the policy based on some approximation to the value function, right? Uh, does this even converge? And intuitively, this is going to converge if the policy doesn't move too quickly, okay? So we need to have reasonably good estimates of which way the policy should be going before we actually change it. So from a theoretical point of view, we have these requirements on the greedification operator that it be conservative. Okay, that it doesn't move too quickly before the, the value estimates have kind of stabilized. Question. Oh, uh, in Wolfman, uh, can you also do a decaying uh, thing with that we do with epsilon greedy with every temperature? Yes, yeah. So Boltzmann exploration uh, basically has a temperature parameter. What we do is we make the policy be... Uh, proportional to the exponential of the value function. So if we have estimates q hat of s and a, the probability pi of taking action a in state s is going to be proportional to e to the q hat of s and a. So this means, you know, we, we take this these, these quantities and we normalize. And uh, of course the exponential means that we don't have to worry about the sign of Q, right? It's going to be, uh, to be taken care of. Uh, and so in this case, we take it to be proportional to uh, Q hat divided by some temperature parameter, right? So typically we start with tau uh, very high, which means that, so if tau goes to infinity, then pi basically goes to uniform. And then what we do is we anneal this, so tau, tau goes to zero over time, and this tau goes to zero over time, um, basically uh, pi goes to greedy. And if we do this slowly enough, and the value function converges to the optimal value function, then, then that's a good idea. And again, you know, in principle, everybody knows that you should do this with decaying temperature, but in practice, often we just pick one because the, the schedules can be finicky, right? Yeah? What's the difference between alpha and gamma? But they have very different meaning. So gamma is, you think of gamma basically as being the horizon of your problem, right? For all practical purposes, it tells you over how many time steps do you really care about the value function, right? So we don't have a fixed horizon. It's not that we care only about 100 time steps. But gamma, since gamma is less than 1, effectively imposes from a numerical point of view a horizon on the problem. Alpha controls the magnitude of the steps in the updates. Okay, so sometimes you think of gamma as being part of the environment, whereas alpha is something that the agent has. And so the agent uh, can decide how aggressively it wants to, uh, to make these kinds of updates. Um, and, and from a sort of numerical point of view and from the point of view of convergence, they have very different roles, right? So for example, alpha is something that you take down to zero, whereas gamma, you never take down to zero. Gamma is fixed, right? Um, and so, so we have many of these parameters. They all are, you know, things between zero and one, but their meaning is very different. The effect is different. And the way that they play a role in convergence properties is also different. And unfortunately, it's hard to get rid of them. So we, we end up just uh, running a lot of optimizations of hyperparameters. Okay. So now what's the contrast between this algorithm, which is a non-policy algorithm, and Q-learning, 
Okay, Q-learning is something that, that Hado discussed, right? Which is the algorithm over here. Q-learning updates with a max. Okay. And one way to think about the, the distinction is, again, by thinking of these kind of backup diagrams. So what does SARSA do? It considers a state action pair and the next state action pair, and that one's sampled from the current policy, right, which is somehow greedy with respect to the value function. What Q-learning does is, no matter what the policy would like to do, Q-learning considers taking the max action. Okay? So you're at the state action pair, you consider all the possible things that you could do from the next state that you happen to sample, and then you imagine that you do the best. Okay? But then you're actually going to do something else, something arbitrary. Right? So this is basically you sitting at lunch and imagining that you're going to eat this really healthy meal and then going and getting the pink cake. Okay? <laughs> but you're not going to actually back up with the pink cake right? directly. You're, you're going to back up with the value of this really healthy meal. So it's a very optimistic kind of view of the world. right? You imagine yourself always doing the right thing, but then you allow yourself to do the wrong thing. Okay? Um, Interestingly, this converges, given an infinite amount of data and given, assuming that you get infinite amount of samples from all the states and so on, converges to the optimal policy. Okay? So, you know, what does this mean? Well, this means the agent knows the best thing to do, might not do it, right? This might sound familiar. We might all know what's the best thing to do, we might just not do it. Okay? But the agent in principle could be optimal. <laughs> now, there's an interesting illustration of the distinction between on-policy and off-policy algorithms, right? Off-policy more generally means you have data from some policy, but you're actually thinking of some other way of behaving, okay? And sort of to illustrate the distinction, there's this little example called the cliff world, okay? So the cliff world is a little navigation task. The agent starts at the start state and has to go to the goal state. And it receives a large negative reward if it falls off the cliff and breaks itself, and otherwise it's just penalized per time step, right? So it's essentially a minimum time to goal task. <laughs> and it's perfectly deterministic, okay? So the optimal path, the shortest path, is to go hugging the cliff, okay, and carefully always take the right action until you reach the goal. That's the shortest path. But of course, our agents sometimes take random actions because they have to get information. Okay? So the agents behave, let's say, in epsilon greedy fashion. They have some probability of taking the suboptimal action. So now, what do the two algorithms learn? Well, in the limit, with infinite amount of data, uh, you know, Q-learning will learn to go by the cliff. But if we're actually running an epsilon greedy policy, Q-learning is going to be pretty bad on the actual trajectories that it runs. Because it's, it always has a tenth of a chance of taking a random action, and if you're next to the cliff and you take a random action, then a quarter of the time, you're actually going to fall off the cliff and you're going to hurt yourself. Okay? So the actual returns that we obtain when we run the algorithm, even though the, the, the agent has the optimal value function, perhaps, right? but it does some random stuff, and so it hurts itself. Now, what does SARSA do? SARSA learns a more conservative policy because it actually backs up from these bad actions, right? And so it understands that its behavior has some randomness in it, and so it can't go always near the cliff, and it ends up taking a path that is a little bit away from the cliff so that the likelihood of you making, you know, three dumb moves in a row is actually quite small, okay? And the actual return ends up being higher. So that's the difference between on policy, right? Actually estimating based on the data that's consistent with that policy, and off policy, which is this kind of dreamy state where you're estimating based on some other policy. Not one of them is better than the other, right? These are two different classes of algorithms. They have a trade-off, okay? The power of off policy learning is that you can use data from anywhere and dream about anything, okay? That's kind of nice. But then you might have these sort of unrealistic expectations, right? So that's, the, that's kind of the, the interesting bit about these things. <laughs> now, there's actually 
something that's intermediate, which is called expected SARSA. And expected SARSA is kind of like SARSA, but instead of just taking one sample of what happened to the agent, it considers an expectation over the possible next actions, but this expectation is taken with respect to the agent's current policy. Okay. And so if the agent's current policy is purely greedy, then you actually get Q-learning, and otherwise you just get this kind of expected update. And so it kind of interpolates between SARSA and Q-learning, and it's an interesting algorithm because it actually gives better performance. So this is uh, the cliff walking task. And we're looking here at the rewards obtained per episode. Again, we're as a function of the step size because all the algorithms have different uh, performance based on the step size. And what you can see is that when you run, um, and so here we have the intermediate performance and then we have sort of the performance that's obtained in the long run. And what you can see is that expected SARSA actually ends up being uh, quite a bit better, okay, in terms of the long-term performance as, long as, as well as in terms of the intermediate performance. And that's basically if, because on one hand, uh, you're averaging, right? So estimates numerically tend to be more stable uh, and the variance is reduced. Uh, but on the other hand, we can uh, sort of like in Q-learning, perhaps be a little bit more optimistic than what, what SARSA would be. And so that's, that's kind of the difference. Now we can also do n steps <clears throat> for, um, for action values. Yep. So this is a function of the step size parameter. Okay. And so what we're seeing is if the step size parameter is too large, then the asymptotic performance kind of goes completely wonky. Okay. Uh, and so that's the... That's sort of the, the end of the curve over here, right? Um, if you pick the step size parameter right, then SARSA actually does reasonably well, right, in the long run. So we're, we're in this regime over here. Uh, but you also see that the step size, you know, this step size, which is kind of conservative and makes, makes small changes, is not good for small amounts of data, right? So it basically moves the values very slowly. It's only good in the, in the long run. Um, so that's, uh, you know, that's, that's another issue, I guess, with some of these algorithms that sometimes you want to have, you know, typically in the early stages of learning, you want to have a reasonably high step size, right, to make updates because you have very little data and so the data is kind of precious. But as you go along, uh, maybe you want to have a smaller uh, value of the step size parameter, and some of these algorithms are more susceptible to that. Okay, so now what do n step methods do? They're about the same for action value functions. Uh, you know, you can just take two steps of the trajectories, however many steps of the trajectories you want, wherever you truncate the trajectory, you use your current estimate. In this case, it's going to be Q estimates. Um, we can also do n step expected SARSA. Right? In that case, you take the first n minus one steps, you take the reward. Wherever you truncate the trajectory, you take an expectation. It's the same thing for Q-learning. So really, in all of these cases, like if you, if you think of this tree and the path through the tree, you can construct all these algorithms very easily okay, by different ways of, of truncating these trajectories. And um, all of these like semi-gradient style methods all carry through in the same way. Right, we just have uh, estimates of the action value function instead of the target. You stick here, whatever it is you want, and step expected SARSA and step expected Q learning, right? Whatever it is, since we're doing semi gradient, we don't care. We're not going to take the derivative of that term. We only take the derivative with respect to the values of the current state and action pair, um, and then uh, we can use these algorithms. So it's it's all of these algorithms. Under certain circumstances, tabular case typically can be proven to converge essentially by appealing to expectations and generalized policy iteration. Um, and uh, when we have general nonlinear function approximation, we know essentially nothing. And there are some cases in which results are quite mixed. So for example, in the case of SARSA with linear function approximation, what we know is that if we use soft 
greenification operators like Boltzmann, for example, and the temperature starts very high and decreases very slowly, then we may end up with convergence. But in other cases, we can end up with chattering. So that means that the algorithm is going to oscillate in between a set of policies. And if you construct sort of pathological examples, the values of the policies in that set can be arbitrarily different, like the worst possible policy in the environment and the best possible policy in the environment. And so, you know, yes, the algorithm doesn't diverge. It converges to a region of policy space, but that region of policy space can be pretty meaningless because it can be very big. So we, we again, don't have uh, perhaps as many uh, interesting results as, as we would hope for. Okay, so uh, let me see if I can, yeah. So I'll, I'll show you uh, one example of the trade-off in n-step methods, which is kind of the same as, as before. This is a, a classical toy problem for continuous control called the mountain car problem. And this is, uh, you know, along with, with many of these other examples, it's available in this uh, collection of environments called GYM that's provided by OpenAI and that many people use now as a standard for, for benchmarking different algorithms because there's a standard collection of environments and also there is some existing code of, of algorithms to compare against. And so mountain car is a control task where you have this little car is trying to drive up on a hill. The goal state is on top of the hill. It can thrust forward, it can thrust in reverse, or it can put in no thrust. And then there's some equations that describe the next position and the next velocity. The interesting thing about it is that from some positions and velocities, the car basically cannot just accelerate all the way to the goal, then things would be uninteresting, but actually it has to sort of build momentum, and so it has to go back and forth, build momentum, and then it can get to the goal. And so the value function ends up with these kinds of discontinuities from two different similar position and velocity pairs. In one case, you can get to the goal directly, and in the other case, you just don't have enough current kinetic energy, and so you have to do this kind of build-up. Um, <coughs> And it's very easy to formulate this as reinforcement learning because we can just say you get a positive reward at the goal and there's some, some discount factor and so you want a minimum time to goal task. And so we can do here a comparison of these n-step methods. Again, uh, n-step SARSA, n-step expected SARSA, and look at the trade-off that's caused by the, by the different values of n. And what you can see, like in the previous examples, is that... Um, First of all, yes, alpha matters, right? You have these kinds of U-shaped curves and the intermediate values of n are the best. And these are some sample log scale learning curves here, okay? Where you can see that the difference between, let's say doing one step and doing eight step in this case can actually be pretty big given the fact that, that you have a log scale um, on that axis there. So typically the n step with some n greater than greater than one is actually better. Now, I'm actually not going to say very much about important sampling because that would take too much. Um, what are our conclusions regarding n-step methods? Well, we can generalize all of our algorithms. Usually intermediate n is better. Uh, there's some extra cost in the computation because you have to do these delayed backups, so you need a little bit of memory. But it's actually interesting that n-step methods have really made a comeback with uh, the resurgence of deep nets. Because from the point of view of a deep network, what you do is you make a buffer, a replay buffer, of lots of states, of state action pairs and their targets. And it doesn't really matter if that target is a one-step target or an n-step target. Right? Then you're going to sort of collect things from the buffer and then do some updates. And so for this type of approximator, really these methods are not uh, that much uh, worse than, uh, than usual things. And a lot, of, a lot of theoretical results are actually applicable and generalized very nicely to this case um, of multi-step bootstrapping. Now there is one more sort of um, idea that can make this a little bit nicer in the case where we want to do things online, and that's the idea of eligibility traces. One way we can think about it is that instead of picking an n, we're going to make a mixture, okay, of all the possible n's, 
with some other parametrization. Um, and uh, the interesting bit about this is that it can be viewed, on one hand, it can be viewed as a form of linear filtering. On another point of view, it can be viewed as, as a memory, but a memory that fades with time. Okay, so like a limited uh, type of memory. And I'm just going to show you first a, a little sort of simulation of what this looks like. Okay, so this is an agent that has an eligibility trace. And you see these little dashes that it leaves behind? Okay, that's basically the extent to which it wants to update all those states or remembers all those states. Okay. So in this case, the agent wants to go from start state to goal state. There's an obstacle. It shouldn't run into that obstacle. Okay. And as it goes along, it kind of remembers uh, where it's been. Okay. And it will update all of the states in the trajectory to some extent. Okay, and the extent is proportional to the length of these dashes. Okay, and what you can see is the agents, uh, so this is sort of like replaying many times the same, the same kinds of uh, things from the beginning to end. At the beginning, the agent doesn't really know what it's doing, so it's kind of like going around in a weird uh, way, but then it finds this path, okay, and uh, always the states that are closer to where the, where the agent currently is are going to get more update and the other states are going to get less update. Okay, so we have this kind of fading memory. So we're going to implement this uh, sort of very easily from a computational point of view using the form of decay. 